from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, hello, my name is Mary Lou Reeker, and on behalf of the Library of Congress's Office of Scholarly Programs and the John W. Kluge Center, I want to welcome you to a lecture by Dr. Joseph Simon, entitled Gano, King, and the Republic of Physics Readers. No cell phones, okay, all cell phones off because we don't want to catch uh, the buzz and the ring on the recording. Um, Dr. Simon holds a PhD in the history of science from the University of Leeds in England. He is a lecturer in that field at the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, and in 2010, he was also a recipient of the Marc Auguste Pictet Prize of the Société de Physique et de Histoire Naturelle de Genève. Following his tenure as a John W. Kluge Fellow, he will return to the University of Paris West as principal investigator with the Marie Curie postdoctoral research program that concerns textbook science. He has held other fellowships through the American Institute of Physics, the Smithsonian's Dibner Library, and the Spanish Ministry of Science. He has written book chapters for a number of volumes published by Spanish, French, and English language, language publishers, and his articles may be seen in refereed journals such as Science and Education, Historia de la Educación and Cultura Escrita y Sociedad. Here at the Kluge Center, Dr. Simon has worked on completing a book that was published this month by Pickering and Chateau Press entitled Communicating Physics. It has a much longer title. I won't read that all, but uh, Communicating Physics. And congratulations, Dr. Simon. Today, Joseph will speak on Gano's textbooks and the international communication of scientific information in the 19th century. In reading a little section of the book, I learned that Gano's textbooks, which we can all learn from as writers, were considered vital largely because of their exceptional clarity, conciseness, smooth narrative, powerful syntax, and precise selection of facts. So to learn more, please help me welcome Dr. Joseph Simon. And I hope you will tell us the long title. Yeah. <laughs> I'll leave that with you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Marilu. I've been here for six months, and I, I would like to thank uh, all the workers at the Library of Congress from the lower grades in the professional and wage scale to the top management positions. And the Kluge Center for having me during these months, its director, Caroline Brown, and in particular, Marie Lou Ricker, for her attention and competence. This talk is connected to two ongoing projects in which I am focusing through several angles and disciplinary approaches on the study of modern science education in historical perspective. The stay as a fellow at the Kluge Center has allowed me to expand my experience in European comparative history, starting to develop expertise on another major case, such as the American. It also has helped me to break fresh ground for my future research through historiographical work and thinking. In this paper, I am going to talk about three things, textbooks, textbooks, and of course, textbooks. I will do first a brief incursion into the public discourse of the foremost authority at the Library of Congress, who happens to be also the President of the United States of America. Second, I will talk also briefly about American textbook physics in the 1950s and 1960s. Third, I will go back one century, and I will provide a quick overview of textbook physics in the 19th century, especially around the 1850s. 
Fourth, I will introduce to you Adolphe Gano, the man who features in the title of this talk as perhaps the king of physics in the three nations. What I mean, according to Alexis de Tocqueville, France, Britain, and the US. Finally, I will provide some examples on Ganot's readerships in France, England, and the US, and I will explain why it is important to take readers into account. The purpose of this talk is mainly historiographical. My aim is to discuss why textbooks matter for history of science, or history of physics in particular, why physics textbooks matter for the history of education and the book history. This doesn't seem to be clear enough in current scholarship. The case of Gano's textbooks, which I have studied in a recent book in comparative Franco-British perspective, as Marie-Lou said, is a notable one. But in my opinion, it's just the, the tip of the iceberg. In an area of studies, that of textbook science, which doesn't exist as a compact disciplinary field, but is instead expressed across several academic disciplines which rarely interact. So let's start with my first point. On January 25, 25 2011, Barack Obama delivered his address on the State of the Union. Now, I have to be humble and cautious and confess that I know little about American politics probably as little or perhaps as little about German or Egyptian, Egyptian politics. But as a citizen in transit through several countries, I thought Obama's was a courageous discourse for its defense of public interest against private interest in a context which seemed at least hostile to this perspective. As a historian of education, Obama's discourse also pleased me because of his stress on the historical significance of science education. But I have several hats, and as a historian of science, I can also say that Obama's discourse was not original, since it followed already classical lines in political discourse. In his address, Obama said, half a century ago, when the Soviets beat us into space with the launch of a satellite called Sputnik, we had no idea how we'd beat them to the moon. After investing in better research and education, we, we didn't just surpass the Soviets, we unleashed a wave of innovation that created new industries and millions of new jobs. And he emphasized, this is our generation's Sputnik moment, a great head headline for newspapers in the following day. Connecting education, science, technology, and international competition has been a constant feature in political discourse since at least the 19th century. And in fact, it is a contested issue that there is a direct or inevitable connection between science, education, and te technological development. Obama's reference to Sputnik is also interesting because it takes us backwards to a very different moment in American history, the 1950s, when in fact major educational reforms conducted especially through new textbook projects took place with the aim of promoting science education in high schools. This, these reforms were also a way for American scientists, in particular physicists, of keeping and expanding the large area of influence in politics and society that they had gained thanks to the collaboration in the World War II effort. This phenomenon has been studied by John Rudolph in his excellent Science in the, Scientist in the Classroom, the Cold War Reconstruction of American Science Education. I will just mention here that in this period, several major textbook physics enterprises were developed with the aim of changing the high school curriculum in physics and its pedagogical implementation. And with a clear aim of increasing enrollments, university enrollments in this field, by both attracting more students and tuning their school education with their university training. Two major examples of these are the textbooks produced by the Physical Science Study Committee on your, on your left and the Harvard Project Physics. These textbooks had an er enormous success in the US and abroad through translations. They mark a period in which American physics became prominent worldwide. This contrasts heavily with the state of affairs in the 19th century. 
The case of the U.S. is particularly interesting because of this transformation from being a peripheral, a peripheral national context in relation to research and education in physics to its subsequent international impact as a radiating center. The history of physics in the U.S. has hitherto barely covered the 19th century period, which shows perhaps still a tendency in history of science to focus especially on stellar moments in scientific research. But in my work, I argue that a less elitist focus on science education helps us to understand greatly the making of scientific disciplines. Let's have, a, let's have a look now on how were things in the 19th century. A review on physics textbooks published in 1851 by Joseph Lovering, the Harvard professor of mathematics and natural philosophy, provides us with relevant factual evidence. In this article, appearing in the North American Review, Lovering provided a wide overview on the status of physics then in America the role of textbooks in this context and the question of their availability. There are many interesting things in Lovering's review. The first is that he considers that textbooks are central in the development of physics and its teaching. However, he's not completely persuaded about the possibility of textbooks taking over other means of communicating physics, such as lectures and lecture notes. This is a typical attitude, which we can also find, for instance, in France between the late 18th century and early 19th century. And it is a mark showing that things were indeed changing in the pedagogy of physics. Lovering considered that textbooks had the power of fixing knowledge, but that they were not able to keep pace with the rapid developments in science, which could instead be expounded in lectures as they were being presented in conferences and journal papers. In post-revolutionary France, another teacher, Joseph Isan, who was a teacher of physics and chemistry, considered that textbooks provided a means of progressing for students and a resource for inexperienced teachers. But he questioned the idea of a standard book to be used for all teachers, for which teacher would have liked dictating the notebooks of someone else? Neither Lovering nor Isan could foresee fully that, in fact, physics textbooks will become dominant in the teaching of physics, that thanks to new techniques in printing and the book trade, they will be able to have large print runs and numerous successive editions incorporating quickly scientific and pedagogical developments, and that textbook physics will become a lucrative international business for authors and booksellers. In fact, the dominance of science textbooks science textbooks has been often contested, and they have not always been central. However, they are still with us, and they have had a fundamental impact for over two centuries already in the shaping of physics as a discipline and in its teaching. Going back to Lovering's review, it seems in principle surprising that he considered that neither in America nor in Britain were there appropriate physics textbooks, and that for these reasons, physicists and physics teachers had to rely on the French and German production in this field. This will be especially surprising in the case of Britain, since the historiography of physics provides this national context with a key role in the development of physics in the 19th century. But let's see how Lovering explained this state of affairs. In fact, the lack of good physics textbooks written in English was not due, in Lovering's opinion, to a lack of major research, but to the type of publications through which British practitioners had communicated it. The monographs and articles composing the series of the Cabinet Cyclopedia, the Library of Useful Knowledge, the Penny Magazine, and the Encyclopedia Metropolitana, all major publication series of, of international renown in this period, had many qualities but they didn't have those required by a textbook. They, like, they lack unity of thought, comprehensiveness, and up-to-dateness. And their subject arrangement, narrative, rhetoric, and expositive focus made them inadequate to communicate efficiently physics to students, being often too academic or too popular. 
There were a few physics textbooks published in English, but they were, according to Lovering, inadequate, as they were written mainly by medical practitioners and addressed to medical students. This was in contrast to the rich French and German textbook physics tradition, which, according to Lovering, would, would count, could count already with a large number of exemplary authors, such as the French Pouillet, Peclet, Pinot, Becquerel, Desprez, Regnol, and Lamé, and the German Müller and Peschel. As you see, it doesn't seem that it was so easy to, to produce a good physics textbook. Actually, this was closely connected to the development of second, secondary education in national perspective in the 19th century. Indeed, in France and the German states, reforms leading to the establishment, establishment or refashioning of structures of secondary and higher education with a large national scope took place in the early 19th century, sooner than in other national contexts. In the same period, the development of physics as a discipline was boosted by its inclusion in secondary education curricula. These educational developments went hand in hand with the production of textbooks, which in many cases had a foundational role and were powerful tools to establish, shape, and standardize pedagogy and physics. A key textbook author in the French context is Adolphe Gano, a French private teacher, alien to the French scientific elite, who published two physics textbooks which became standard introductions to physics worldwide. Gano published his first textbook in 1851, the same year as Lovering's Alarmist Review. The success of the book made it have large print runs and almost an edition per year or every two years. Here you have the title page of the Traité, and you can see then the huge number of editions that the Traité had. The Traité was a book connected to Adolf Gano's teaching in his school in Paris, where he was mainly preparing students for an examination with governed science and education in, in this period, which was the baccalaureate et science. Uh, and he published another book, The Cours de Physique, uh, targeting a more open market of general readers and, and, and popular science, but also, for instance, primary school teachers which had also a great number of editions over a long period. In 1880, the 18, edi the 18 edition of Ganos Traité had a print run of 20,000 copies. By this year, Gano had sold already more than 200,000 copies of his Traité and more than 60,000 copies of his Cour. Furthermore, both books were translated into many languages. You can see here the title page of, of the Cours de Physique. And you can see here, for instance, the English translation, published in London by a French publisher, by Lier, and the translation published by Longmans in London, Longmans, which was, in the 19th century, the, the most important publisher in every field in, in England. And you can see the, an American translation published by A.S. Barnes, an educational publisher, only one year after the publication of the Cour in France, in Paris, there was a translation for the American market. You, I, you have seen how many copies, and, and it is, there is not a lot of work on print runs in the case of science textbooks, but the number of copies published by and sold by Gano is, is impressive and, and looking a bit at other type of books, it's, uh, there are few books which really surpass this type of print runs and, and, and global number of copies. Uh, for instance, we could find that classics like La Fontaine's Fables uh, had more copies sold in the 19th century, of course. We can find also uh, fiction like Jules Verne's novels, very popular in the period, who had higher print runs, or uh, extremely successful popular science book like uh, Camille Flammarion's Popular Astronomy, who had a, an average number of copies similar to Gano's textbook. So it is really impressive. On the other hand, uh, concerning print runs, the, the British or English uh, translations of Gano's textbooks 
had a lower uh, number of uh, ed editions and, and print runs than, than the French ones. But in any case, uh, they sold much more copies than science classics, which uh, have received far more attention, such as Robert Chambers' Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, or even Charles Darwin's Origins of Species, just to give you a bit of a comparative view. And you can see the impressive number of translations. It was usual for physics, for French physics, to be translated in the 19th century, but probably not to that extent. We have 12 translations for the Traité, and a lower number, but still a considerable one in uh, for, for the case of the coup. And it is quite interesting, the, the most important translations in terms of of editions and numbers uh, were the, the, translation, the translations into Spanish and into English. Uh, there were two translations into Spanish, one published in, in, in Madrid uh, by a French publisher established in Spain uh, by Lee Bailier from a famous publishing family, and a, a, a translation published in Paris by a French publisher, uh, Bourret, who was targeting especially the Latin American market in a period of independence of the Latin American republics and development of school systems, etc. And in the English, in the case of English, uh, we have uh, the editions published in London, which circulated also in, in America through agreements of longmans with uh, publishers, scientific and medical publishers in New York. Uh, but we have also the American translation of the coup, as, as I have said. So with these numbers, we should think, what is the status of Gano as an author? This image synthesizes very well the question. The tombstone of Adolphe Gano in the cemetery of Montrouge in Paris. You can see that the tombstone still fell down. It happened at least 10 years ago, and the tombstone is abandoned. This is a useful, a very useful visual metaphor because although Ganot's test books are known by some historians of physics, only a couple of scholars have published some papers on his work and my recent monograph is the first work to deal in detail with it. And Ganot's test book physics is still absent in the standard historiography of physics. The last synthesis on this topic, the excellent When Physics Became King by Ewan Morus, published with the University of Chicago Press, is not an exception, and also pays little attention to the role of school science education. This is where the key question lies, the role of science education and how it is considered within history of science. Gano is a nobody. Among a large, a large body of nobodies who devoted their professional life to write science textbooks. This is in contrast to the international success and cross-cultural cross penetration that Ganot's physics had in the 19th century. See, for instance, uh, an illustration of how Ganot's physics was received in England. And this is just an example among an uh, incredibly large number of reviews. As you can see, the publication of Ganot's textbook was connected in fundamental ways to the development of a scientific discipline such as physics, which was expanding in secondary education, especially. You have to think that, that there were not even one PhD student in physics per year in France or, or, or in England in this period. I mean, the, the discipline was very small. I mean, maybe it didn't exist yet. I mean, there were very few students in universities studying physics, but the secondary education market was something different. And, and physics had a place there, and, and it was expanding, and its publics were expanding. So as we can see, for this, the case of England, there was a demand created by the development of a new type of educational framework in which France and Germany created earlier than other countries an economy, an educational economy, and an economy of the book trade linked to this educational economy. But it is not completely true that there were no physics textbooks in Britain and the US. Just that on the one hand, 
Available textbooks were not adequate for the new pedagogical framework, as we have seen, according to Lovering. That British and American teachers did not often have the required experience to prepare those type of textbooks. And on the other, that they were not able to compete with French textbook products, which were sold and translated in their countries. And how did this happen? The role of booksellers and publishers was fundamental. And you can see here the network, the international network of the Bailliers. The Bailliers opened their first shop in Paris. They focus especially on, on, on medical publications. Uh, and uh, the starter of the firm, Jean-Baptiste Baillier, is a well-known publisher among historians of medicine because he, he really governed the publication of medicine, which had an important center in Paris for a very long time. It is a period for the expansion of the book trade. Uh, it is incredible how things change compared to the 18th century in terms, for instance, of speed, in terms of transports, uh, how quick you can have a foreign book in your shop in London, in New York, or in Paris. And the French had a leadership in this field. Because of cultural aspects, the the still importance of French as a language, a language known by every bookseller in the world, uh, but also for any economical reasons, as it happened usually, and, and it's it's uh, even based on a on a classic 19th century economical theory. Even if I'm not an expert, French publishers went abroad because they fear bankruptcy caused by overproduction. And there were a few important crises uh, in the first half of the 19th century where major publishers in, in Paris or in London went bankrupt. And a way of avoiding it was to take the reminders out of the country and try to sell them somewhere else. But this evolved into, into other things. And the Bailliers is, is an important case. Arguably, the, we can consider the Bailliers the major scientific and medical publishers in international perspective in the 19th century. And the Bailliers, a family business, expanded, expanded from their Paris uh, base to establish bookshops and publishing companies in London by Hippolyte Baillier, in New York by the sons of Hippolyte Baillier, Hippolyte Baillier, who emigrated to America, in Melbourne or in Madrid. Uh, the Bailliers had a major role in the introduction of Ganot's physics in England and subsequently in, in America. And they published the translation, the publishing uh, in, in English in London, and they published also the Spanish translation in Madrid. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as I have said, uh, the English translation of Ganot's textbooks was taken over uh, by Longmans, the major British publisher in, in this period, uh, because of unforeseen circumstances, but Hippolyte Baillier uh, uh, died young, and, and so the business was closed, and, and, and the network was reduced a little bit. Uh, and Longmans had also important connections, or started to develop important connections international connections in this period, so they sold a part of the, of the print run of the, the treatise and the natural philosophy, the two translations of Ganos textbooks in, in English, uh, in America through New York, agreements with New York, and also in India. And I'm not going to talk a lot really about this, but we have to think also about the developing book enterprise in America, where we start to see how publishers emerge, who is specializing in the school textbook market. Uh, a school market which developed early because, in contrast to, to Britain, uh, America, uh, the US developed a network of schools uh, uh, quite early. It is, uh, it is a, an early phenomenon in the US. And we can see 
publishers like Alfred Smith Barnes, based in New York, who, for instance, around the 1840s starts a series called the National Series of Standard School Books, in which the translation of Ganot's School in, for the American market is published. And here you can see uh, a review of the American translation of Ganot's book, translated by William Guy Peck, who was at Columbia University but had previously been uh, at the West Point Military Academy. And we can see why a textbook like Ganot can be so successful. The review starts, there is no lack of school books on natural philosophy, such as they are, but very many of them have sprung from the scissors of the bookmaker rather than the pen or brain of the author. And many such works, crude and full of errors, hold their place in schools and academies rather through the tact and enterprise of publishers or the negligence of school committees than from any intrinsic merits of their own. So you can see there were, there were a good number of physics textbooks in the American market by American authors, by the American publishers, but these textbooks didn't have the, the integrated experience that French or German textbooks could have, at least in physics. Because we have to think that in France, the, the textbook market for secular educa education had started to develop in the early 19th century. So by 1851, we had teachers who had been teaching with a certain special type of focus for decades and had been improving their pedagogical experience and their experience, in, experience as writers. And I want you to focus in another aspect, which is basic, which, which is the illustrations, the illustrations contained in Gano's textbooks, because Gano, in collaboration with printers and draughtsmen and engravers, was a pioneer in the introduction of a new type of illustration, an illustration which used wood engraving and also which integrated illustrations in the text of textbooks. And I will explain this further. But we can see in this review where it says, as an elementary work, it is concise in style, yet remarkably clear in definition and explanation, logical in arrangement, and beautifully illustrated with numerous engravings, which are facsimile copies of those in the original work. These engravings are so complete and accurate that they are not only well calculated to convey to the mind of the pupil a clear conception of the principles unfolded, but exhibit so fully the structure of apparatus and methods of experimenting as to Reader the apparatus, no, as to fully the structure, no, sorry, as to read the apparatus itself in many cases. And yeah, render. yeah, yeah, exactly. As to render the apparatus itself in many cases unnecessary. It is interesting because Ganot's school, when Ganot published his second textbook, his intention uh, was to make physics available to students and teachers who didn't have the possibility of buying a scientific instrument collection. Uh, the instrument trade was very important. Physics was very focused on the description and use in lecture demonstrations of scientific instruments, but there were many people who didn't have access to these collections, which were expensive. And one of the aims of Gano in, in, in making contracts with uh, draughtsmen and, and printers uh, was to make a collection accessible through illustration. And this happened, and, and many people use the, the textbooks in this way. And you can see here uh, the typical way of illustration scientific instruments during the first half of the 19th century. Uh, usually, uh, the technique was engraving in copper plates, and, and you could find this type of illustrations at the end of textbooks in folded uh, leaves. Uh, as you can see, it's very schematic, but this was the top class of scientific instrument illustration in this period. And you can see here in comparison with, at the bottom, two images of Ganot's way of illustrating his textbooks. On the left, the traité, uh, you can see an instrument using acoustics, uh, 
the bell also and, and with uh, some flutes used by in acoustic research by people like Koenig. And on the right, an illustration of the coup, more popular introducing human figures uh, to make integrate the reader in the action of, of experimenting with instruments or demonstrating with instruments. Another engraving. This is an electrostatic machine in a classical mold designed by Gigi Ransden. And as I say, uh, this uh, had a major impact, a major impact in the success of, of the books. Uh, but also, as we will see later, uh, this was not just for decoration or to make attractive the books. These engravings had important uses, and there is a lot of knowledge integrated in these illustrations. The only thing is that we have a different visual culture now and different types of expertises, and, and, and it's not easy to read them. But there were, for instance, draughtsmen involved in Ganot's textbook projects who had also secret, so to say, commissions by uh, Parisian businessman to do uh, espionage in some of the international exhibitions happening in Paris. And I don't know if you know, but in the first international exhibitions, the, the great exhibition in London and subsequent exhibitions in Paris, it was forbidden to draw in front of machines or instruments because this, will, this could be a way to steal the design of, of this. And many of the exhibitors had a lot of concerns about it. And one of Ganot's draughtsmen had the mission of going to the international exhibition and draw some of the exhibits. And how did he do? He will do, see, memorize it, and with the skill of someone with expertise on scientific instruments and machines and on drawing them, he will go back and draw them at home. You know? So there is a lot of with these illustrations also of possibilities of do what is called today reverse engineering, no? where, where people with expertise can, can look at the, at the illustration and know even what might be inside the mechanism of the instrument, okay? So I'm going to talk now about readers and you will see some of these uses with illustrations and in the reading of the text and the, and the, and the images. And I'm just going to show some examples. I, in my book, there is a whole chapter on readers, and I argue that the picture of physics as a discipline is incomplete. We don't take into account readers, too, and how readers produce meaning, and, and we should take into account you know, how uh, different people see different things in reading the same text. And I have investigated uh, reading, readers and readings in different contexts, in the context of formal education. Of course, this was a basic context where the reading of Ganot's textbook physics took place. Uh, and it was a standard introductory work, as I have said, in medical schools, secondary education, the first years in college education, et cetera, et cetera. In formal education, for instance, courses for artisans or workers, General reading, literary journals, novels, etc. But also, as we will see in research, a textbook produced for secondary education or the interface between secondary education and, and, and university through this examination that I mentioned, but in France, the baccalaureate, but also in Britain and in America through examinations which little by little were becoming uh, the way to access higher education, but at the same time, they were certificates uh, when leaving secondary education. So let's see an example, for instance. This is an examination uh, in 1865 of a French student who attended the examination of the baccalaureate science at the University of Strasbourg, and he he has not been very lucky as, because this is not a very nice way to go into historical record, but he was surprised after examiners look at his 
paper, uh, they consider that he had introduced a copy of Ganon's textbook in the examination room. They consider it was evident, and obviously he, he didn't pass the examination, and even there were disciplinary measures, and he couldn't attend the examination for a certain amount of years. And, well, I mean, what this student was not cautious because what lost him was the numerical table that you can see at the bottom. When the examiner had a look at the paper, he said, no way, I mean, no one can, not even a researcher, can learn this table of numerical values, which were actually barometric corrections, by heart. There's something wrong here. So what's the first thing that this examiner did? He said, let's have a look at Gano. I mean, it is the standard textbook. And you can see that the, the passages underlined, which is almost everything, are the sentence, sentences copied literally of the book. The examiner also say that, that even the figures are copied. And it is interesting to look at this document because we can see a replication of, of the textbook page layout with an insertion of images together with text and numerical tables. Okay, so this is a, a certain way of using Anos textbooks, okay? <laughs> Another example is this poem uh, published by a student in Harvard College where he says, it was near the semi-annuals, my heart I curb for study's sake. I left the world behind and solemnly resolved to take an everlasting grind. My grade was filled with freshman coke, my call was somewhat low, when I began to sport my oak and interview Gano. My love for physics had, I fear, been all too slight before. I counted throughout the year an illustrated bore. And when conditions night by night came in my dreams to me, I wish Gano was out of sight and buried in the sea. <laughs> for physics, I was all on man. And is there one who thinks that he could study with a band performing Captain Janks? I show her my pending hopes, of course. He will be the sooner cease. For says Gano, increase the force, the time will then decrease. And this alone I learned from all my weary misspent hours to wit that powers mechanical are unlike mental powers. My mind I found with late remorse, the more and more I tried, gave constantly decreasing force tangentially applied. <laughs> so we can see how Ganot's physics was ingrained in the culture of formal education and among students. This is just one case, there were many others, even Ganot's textbooks feature in, in ceremonies which happen in certain American colleges, like for instance at the University of Michigan where there was a ceremony at the end of the year of the burning of the physics, no? and you can think what happened, no, it's obvious. No? As for general reading, uh, there are several examples of the appearance of, of references to Ganot uh, in literature. And for instance, we can see in the work of the Swedish playwright August Strindberg where he uses Gano as a way of describing the tensions between the two sexes. As we can see, there is a kind of love and hate relation no, going on with Gano, which means that his physics was loved by many people, I guess. And as I have said, uh, we can find uh, an, a very different use, which probably is unexpected in relation to the type of ideas that we have about textbooks and, and how they have been integrated within narratives in history of science. And this is an example by Professor William Thompson, also known as Lord Kelvin, where he's writing to a colleague, Thomas Andrews, in, a chemist in Belfast, uh, and they are discussing uh, information about apparatus for the use of uh, lighting in, in lighthouses in, in particular, which was a topical field of technological development in this period. And William Thompson offers different pieces of information. One of them are notes that he has taken, taken while attending an international exhibitions and he, uh, an exhibition and he saw uh, a particular machine and he took notes as a, an expert engineer 
with a, a very detailed description, as you can see, of the number of bobbins, uh, their dimension, etc. And another one is addressing his colleague to an illustration in Ganot's physics. Okay, so we can see the power of these illustrations for reference on technological development in this period. Uh, there are other examples, like for instance, the, engine, the British engineer Sebastian de Ferranti, who was a very successful businessman in the development of uh, electrical measure instruments. Uh, he used some of the diagrams in, in Gano as an inspiration for the basic structure or mechanism of his electrical measurement apparatus. Or there is also the case in France of Zenob Gram, which was Belgian, but emigrated to Paris to work and was almost illiterate. Uh, he's known as, as one of the inventors of the dynamo. Or dynamo. And apparently, uh, even if it probably is, it's a bit exaggerated like in any uh, inventor's biography, but, uh, but they say that uh, he only had two books, a French dictionary and Ganot's traité. Okay. We have also examples in the, in the American case, and for instance, in the notebooks of Thomas Edison, we can find references to Ganot. You can see here the, the machine in particular, which was an engraving ta taken in a workshop uh, uh, very soon after this instrument uh, was, this apparatus was work, uh, was uh, invented and put into practice. And as I was saying, in the American case, we have also the case of William Graham Bell, where he makes reference towards the bottom of the page uh, of Ganot's physics uh, in relation to data. You remember the table in, in the student examination in relation to data about the gravity of certain materials, where he's investigating flight technologies and, and and he needs data about the, the weights to calculate data about the weights of different materials for uh, his prototypes, which are basically different types of kites. So we can see that, that this textbook was also, was also used in research and that textbooks can be used in research, no? which might be surprising. And I am going to end my talk with the same quotation with which I started it in silence. There is in principle no, not, no direct connection between this quote, quotation from a novel by the Spanish writer Pio Baroja and Ganot's physics. Pio Baroja was our Spanish writer of the 98th generation and he reflects quite a lot in his novels about science. Baroja, even if there is not a direct connection, Baroja was once a high, a high school student, like all of you. And he had good and bad memories from his science education at school, like you. And it is very likely that he encountered Ganot's textbooks in his school physics classics, since it was such a standard textbook in this time. As the title of Iwan Moru's book, When Physics Became King, which I have mentioned, indicates, indeed, in the 19th century, physics became king. This was a key period, period for its establishment as a discipline. And it made so and became very much the paradigm for science in the 20th century, based on scientific prestige, but also, among other things, its technological applications and notably its applications to war. But I am not going to moralize here like Baroja does in his work. However, as a historian, it is worth to discuss if physics really needs a king of physics. Pierre Simon Laplace, Lord Kelvin, James Clerk Maxwell, Hermann Helmholtz, Adolf Gano. Political narratives have often a logic which emphasizes heroes, inventors, and origins. Fair enough, if everyone is happy with this. But the history of science, and in particular the history of physics, can go much further. 
as it has today the tools of a sophistica sophisticated field of inquiry, perhaps it is more relevant to consider physics as a republic, a republic of practitioners and authors, among which textbook authors, who are often mainly teachers, writers, and readers. And why not making another step forward and consider physics as a republic of readers? Readers who in general are nobodies and do not appear in standard histories, but who can tell us a lot about physics as a discipline and about its status in culture and society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, questions? Yes. Um, first of all, I think it was a fabulous talk. I've learned many things, uh, also okay. funny things, in a way. Um, uh, first of all, uh, it was the first time I heard of book publishers going abroad because of the fear of going bankrupt. So this, this is normally actually the logic that imperialists use. So this is a, an example of textbook imperialism. Right? <laughs> oh, it's very nice. Also, I noted and I, I was greatly delighted uh, to, to see that you found that the illustrations in the textbook so important. You call it reverse engineering. Mm -hmm. I call it 19th century version of open access because that's, of course, you show, you show exactly what is going on. But, that, um, uh, but there was one thing I wanted to ask you, um, a, a little bit more boring question, but still. Um, you spoke about textbooks. What is the role of um, I mean, because I have this idea in the di differentiation of, let's say, economies, in my case, or in your case, uh, of a scientific discipline, you clearly see the role or the, the role of observations, and not even specialist observations, textbooks. But what is the role of journals, for instance? Uh, is that role already important in the 19th century or not? <laughs> yeah, I mean, journals are fundamental and and. There is work which argues that journals have a fundamental role in the professionalization of physics in particular. And but I do not necessarily mean a professional scientific journal, but I mean mm -hmm. more popular scientific Yeah, yeah, journal. yeah. Did that, did that exist, for instance? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, popular science was a great phenomenon in the, in the 19th century, especially, and uh, well, it's, it's also a, a phenomenon generating in the 19th, 19th century fundamentally, and with uh, uh, great centers of development in, in France and, and in Britain. I mean, these are the most well-known cases, but, all, but it happens in many other places, of course. And, and obviously there is an interaction in the sense that we have professional journals, which also they very often they are linked to professional societies, so they are very important in the development of physics or science in general. And we have popular science uh, journals uh, which popularize uh, knowledge, and, and we have to think obviously in, in, in the perspective of the period where entertainment is uh, what in France is called the Jean du Monde, you know, people who had time to, exactly. Uh, it's uh, based on, uh, I mean, people go to conferences, lectures, uh, demonstrations uh, by instruments and, and, and of instruments and apparatus, and, and very often the boundaries are not clear, you know. So, for instance, in Ganot's, in Ganot's physics, we can see Ganot, I mean, uh, I have studied Ganot as a reader, where his, one of his major aims is to transform journal science into textbook science. And there are connections in the narratives, but there are differences, you know, so. Just one related thing as well. Um, I like the, uh, the very direct connection you made between uh, textbooks and scientific development. Normally, we tend to think about scientific development in terms of, you know, ideas and stuff like that, which is all nice. But um, what is really nice about what you talked about is the way that Ganon's illustrations also were setting a standard in industrial production mm -hmm. and the way of design of machines and stuff. Mm -hmm. That is, I think, very, very, mm -hmm. very good. So on the other hand, it is, I mean, the, the thing is that uh, historians of science, we tend to focus uh, more on higher education where research happens. Principle. But this is a contemporary view because, I mean, uh, uh, secondary school teachers did research in this period. And also, 
uh, as, as uh, Catherine Olesko has shown very well, uh, the people, uh, the, the, the training in universities was very heavily addressed to training teachers for secondary education. And very often the secondary education curriculum shape the university curriculum and not vice versa. So you can see. I don't know. Uh, I, I was struck by the number of additions in Italian and Spanish. Hmm. I was wondering if you could say, uh, not exactly places where you think that, I was stunned that there were something like 27 Italian hmm. additions mm -hmm. in this, almost an addition every three years. Yeah. Can I ask my question on the base? Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. I Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know the, the Italian case, but I think that obviously uh, the, the context in Italy, I mean, they were invaded uh, by Bonaparte, you know, and, and, and there was a, a heavy, a strong influence from French culture. And, and even, I mean, Ganoin talks about research by many Italian physicists like Carlo Matteucci and who actually were traveling from Italy to Paris and, and doing research in Paris, etc. No, so I can imagine that the, the Italian context had a, a, a development in secondary education, which was connected with a French influence, no, and that they needed textbooks and there was a, a, a fluid communication, no, between them. But you find many types of things, you know, because I have not mentioned, but textbook translations are very different to literary translations because. A teacher needs a text to teach his class. And uh, usually there is an adaptation to the educational context and some of these translations are very free, you know, and, and even if they still have the name of, of the original author. And with the Spanish case, there is obviously a French relation which had happened also through invasion, but also through the circulation of students. Uh, but then we, we don't seem to see a, a Portuguese no. translation. No. And that market in Brazil. Mm -hmm. which Portugal also had yeah. a connection with. In Portugal, the French editions were used. Because I have not said it, but the French editions were used also in America. I mean, before there were translations, uh, or even in parallel, there were used. And I don't know why there was not a, a translation into Portuguese. Uh, but in the Spanish case, uh, what happens is also is that there is a quite early development of secondary education, not as early as uh, Spain or Germany, but probably similar to the case of the U.S., where the, the secondary education system with a national scope is established in 1845, and, and with a strong connection with, uh, with uh, France, because, for instance, like the first collections uh, bought for every school and university in Spain uh, in around the 1840s, they are purchased in Paris, where the Ministry uh, of Education or the Secretary of Education goes to Paris and makes purchases to French instrument makers. And obviously, Ganot's textbooks and other French textbooks are agents of propaganda for French instrument makers because they, are, they, they introduce drawings of real collections, you know, and, and real collections of teachers like Gano, who reproduces his own collection, his, the collection of his school, but also he goes to the workshop. And you have to think that it's, it's Paris, but even it's, it's a tiny space, the, the Latin quarter or neighborhood in Paris, where you have a, an, a, a dynamic system of publishers, instrument makers, teachers, researchers, and it's a very competitive world in, in just a few streets around, the, especially the, the Faculty of Medicine and the, the Polytechnic School. No? And concerning copyright, I have not investigated it in detail, but 
there are no there is no international law of copyright there are certain agreements between different countries and in general these agreements for instance the agreement uh, between britain and france is uh, that you need to deposit a copy of your book in a national library whether the, the french or the british and that this uh, secures even the author is obliged like i mean copyright agreements today no but for instance, there are some reviewers uh, for the American case where they say that even foreign textbooks are promoted in America more uh, than, than you should expect because it's a way for, of getting them for free for American publishers. They just can take them you know, and, and they don't pay anything. It doesn't happen with Gano uh, in the American case because uh, there are agreements uh, uh, with uh, the... the editions published in London, uh, they, are, they are just sent to America and there are two publishers who just change the title page to have their name, but it's an agreement with the London publisher. Another interesting thing to finish is that uh, the illustrations have also an entity or an identity which is very strong and comparable to text because there is a separate copyright of the illustrations and of the text. And Gano sometimes sells his illustrations, but not his test. And there are authors who use the illustrations and they write a different book. So this is uh, quite interesting. Mm -hmm. So thank you for, for the really interesting talk. So I, I'm, I'm really interested in the way that you talk about the sort of republic of readers and Gano as a potential king, which I take to be a way that you're addressing the issue of authority <laughs> Which I, I'm wondering how you hear that. Is that a is that a sign that there's a certain um, populism or democratization of education going on here, or and it doesn't necessarily <laughs> have to be either or, I suppose. Or is it a sign that um, people are uh, stopping doing experiments on their own and are now relying more heavily on a textbook to sort of tell them what what to do? <laughs> yeah, I mean. The usual approach in history of science will be to tell, oh, this is just a sign of what we already knew. You know, textbooks are dogmatic and creative, and bookish science is not really science. And this might have happened, as I say, people who didn't have access to these instruments, maybe they, they studied just with illustrations. But on the other hand, it is interesting that I didn't mention, but it is also quite usual to find uh, letters to the editor in journals where teachers, they write, and they write to, in, to indicate that there are certain uh, mistakes or errors in Ganot's textbooks. And very often this involves repeating the experiments. Who, they are not always rocket science experiments. I mean, some of them are mainly demonstrative, but there are all others which are historical experiments or experiments which happened in the previous years. But you can see how the teachers have performed the experiment described with engravings and text. They have realized that there was a problem and, and an error, and they get back to, so, so you can see that the book also promotes uh, this engagement with experiment. I mean, it's not just bookish. And the interesting thing, and, and I, I take in part my idea of this republic uh, from there, is that even if they are indicating errors, they don't criticize Ganot's physics. They say that Ganot's physics is a great book and that they are just sending these letters in order to improve it even more, which shows you that Ganot's physics becomes a collective heritage, you know, and every teacher and reader is proud of it and want to improve it, you know, and you have this collective of, of readers, teachers, and textbook authors who are, and students who make this republic, no? Uh, there was there was another yeah, maybe.
<laughs> or other kinds of you know, a teacher writing in and saying, who was my experienced group in the class, or any of those things, talking about prescribing reading. <laughs> yeah. I have not found many direct sources because uh, Gano is an unknown character, so I mean, there are no notebooks. I mean, the image of his tombstone is the, and his textbooks is the closest we can get to him and, and, and records about maybe the, the premises that his school had in Paris. So it's, it's incredibly difficult and you probably know how difficult it is to find these lecture notes or student notes, etc. But when I found this examination, it was like a miracle, you know, after being, <laughs> I mean, and I was very happy because I so I had an hypothesis and it worked, you know, like history exists, you know, <laughs> as a discipline, you know, and, but, uh, but I have tried to cover this uh, problem uh, with, uh, by checking uh, student guides. And, and, and there is a, I found for the French and British case, uh, student guides, uh, which were addressed, addressed to the type of students which will uh, go to certain examinations and use GANO, and, and with all the evidence I could kind of close the, the question. And they, they are giving very clear indications about how to use uh, textbooks uh, uh, to prepare for examinations. So there are indications about when to read them, even like saying don't read them in the evening, don't go to the library where they have journals because it's a distraction, but also besides these kind of funny aspects, uh, more specific things about uh, how to proceed. If reading first a passage, then trying to repeat the, the experiments, uh, then, you know, like going back home, trying to write about the topic and things like that. So, thank you. Really? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> That's this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.